Let's move on about something that concerns all of us. Now, Albert, Albert Einstein reportedly referred to compounding as the eighth wonder of the world. And joining us now to explore the dynamics of life stage investing and the strategy behind it is Johan House, Executive Director at APSA Investments. I won't ask you about uh, whether this is the eighth wonder of the world or not, but let's perhaps paint a picture for us in terms of life stage investing. It's just how good are South Africans? Or maybe let me turn it around. How bad is the situation? I think there's, there's a couple of pitfalls that uh, investors face on their journey towards retirement. And I think the life stage model can maybe help us overcome some of those pitfalls. And what the life stage model really says is that every one of us are at a certain stage in our lives. It could it be early, uh, early career, mid career, late career, early retirement, late retirement. And during each of those stages, really, you need to identify what is your main objective. Right. You could have multiple objectives, but what is your main long term objectives? It will say then, how much risk do you need to take to reach those objectives? Right. And it will also then tell you pretty much uh, what's kind of the investment strategy that you have to have. Right. And that really is what it's all about. And it gives you a more of a longer term perspective yeah. when you're doing your planning rather than the short termism that we're finding and that really derails people's investment strategies. Yeah, but where do we stand now in terms of the overall South African situation? I mean, we're hearing in Europe that they will have to work longer because people are living longer. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think longevity is a, is a major problem around the world. And um, I think in South Africa, we're also finding that um, you know, there's material kind of challenges for people. A lot of people, very few people can actually uh, retire financially independent, which means that they are not uh, they're in a position where, where they are completely independent from other people's financial assistance. So um, we've got a lot of work around mm -hmm. financial literacy for a start, I would say. And mm -hmm. that's at different levels, mm -hmm. from very basic literacy to a recent better understanding of exactly some around some of the investment principles that people need to understand, <coughs> specifically around the relationship between time, risk and return, and how wonderful those three elements can work together to actually help you achieve your financial goals. Mm. Could, could I just ask, what, um, you know, given the environment, the economic environment that we're in now and which could persist for the next uh, few years, what sort of returns are you now <coughs> anticipating for the equity market, for instance? Have you lowered your expectations? Uh, from what to what, or why they're still the same as what they were before? Oh, no, absolutely. Um, we have downgraded those, those return expectations. I think we've seen a golden decade yeah. of um, returns in South Africa specifically um, across all the asset classes. Yeah. What we know is that we're not going to see those returns going forward. Um, therefore, you will have to most probably uh, position yourself in a way where you can invest in asset classes that can really give you reflation beating returns. And, and what is inflation? Is it the CPI number? Um, or is it for the people specifically at the top end, maybe much higher than that when you look at medical costs and uh, fuel costs and all of that. So um, I think you know, for, for our expectation is that you will most probably have to, to look at your strategy very differently from, from five or six mm. years ago. Mm. Johan, what prevents people? I mean, let's say I'm a 25-year-old and I'd lap up what you're saying. I mean, I'm not sure many 25-year-olds do sit down and say, well, I, you know, I can't wait till I'm 65, so let me start planning now. Um, but how does one actually encourage a, a, a culture, if you will, of that long-term thinking? When in fact, what we observe in South Africa is that people would appear to consume first and foremost rather than invest. Yeah. Yeah. No, that is a major challenge. I think um, the, the lifestyle funding type of challenges that we have, people are, want to look good and want to be seen to be doing well and all of that. And it really, it comes back to me from, from a school level even, to yes. educate them on the basic uh, principles. For instance, we started out with the concept of compounding, to make yep. people understand, if you can make your money work for you as long as possible, um, what the effect could, of that could be over 20, 30 years. But it's, it's difficult for people to think 20, 30 years down the line. Yeah. And again, life staging actually puts you in a position where if you just put that life stage of that person in front of them, where they realize you know, um, that they may be running out of time, or, as I said, the amount of time they actually do have to do something about yes. their financial future. And they can yeah. start with something very small. So it is about financial literacy from school all mm -hmm. the way through to the time when you can get yeah. them to a point where they can create a habit of saving. I'm actually hoping that they, we've got 25 year olds in the studio, actually. The cameraman behind you there is actually certainly that age range, and I'm certainly hoping that uh, uh, she is listening. But the, the interesting thing is that one of the figures that we saw today, for instance, coming with the retail sales data mm -hmm. that came through, is that retail sales have been uh, buoyed in part by above wage inflation increases, mm -hmm. and then also the social grants that we saw, and then also at the same time government has been expanding its, uh, its on the employment side. Mm -hmm. And what's been happening is that 
that money has been plowed into consumption. Mm -hmm. It doesn't look like any of that money is going into, into, into retirement. No, the only parties that's really saving this country at the moment is the corporates. Um, and, and, and you're not finding that that money is going towards savings. So um, we've, we've really got a big challenge there in terms of getting people to Whose understand. Whose job is it? I think it is Yours the financial in institutions. Yeah. I think it's the product providers in, in, in this country. Um, and I think, it's, it's, uh, I think government has got a big part to play in terms of the curriculum, the way we design what we teach our kids at school. Mm -hmm. um, that should be a key part of it. You know, I've, I've had people say to me who invest in unit trusts, mutual funds, that the cost of it, mm -hmm. In fact, historically, the cost has been fairly high. And that tends to, pe people tend to have a jaundiced view because then they look five years down the road and they see the costs. Mm -hmm. Perhaps a transparency would be quite useful here in, in mm -hmm. so far as what it costs to invest and, mm -hmm. and the actual vehicle that you use. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, and that's maybe where the total expense ratio or the TERs that is now being implemented across specifically the collective investment space. Um, already brings a lot of transparency, mm -hmm. um, but I think one should always also measure up the whole. You should find that balance between what you get uh, is what you're going to be willing to pay for, you mm -hmm. know. And, and and but I do think we still we can become more creative in this country mm -hmm. in creating more affordable savings vehicles. Mm -hmm. And did Johan House, Executive Director at Ups Investment. Thank you for watching. Andrea and uh, Aubrey, I hope you are listening, and I certainly hope you'll come into my office tomorrow morning and we'll speak about that.